and you continue to do so, you are entitled thereafter only to a qualified privilege in respect of your evidence. You are directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings is to be given, and you are asked to respect the parliamentary practice to the effect that, where possible, you should not criticise or make charges against any person or entity by name or in such a way as to make him or her it identifiable. Um, Ms McGinley, can we have your opening remarks, please, and, and could you try to confine them to five minutes or so? Yes. So as to allow time for questioning. Thank Great. you very much. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Um, we'd very much like to thank the committee for the invitation um, and um, uh, look forward to having a, a good discussion with you. Um, normally, we would have a worker here with us, um, however, to give, their, to give their experience and testimony, however, such as the fear of workers to, to uh, uh, be in a, a, public a public place, um, that it might jeopardise their livelihood and employment. So we didn't actually ask somebody to come here with us. Um, it is a group of people who have been asked during a global pandemic to get vital food to our homes. Um, they do deserve our respect and uh, a government and an employer body, uh, employers that prioritise their safety. We know the meat sector is a multi-billion export sector. Um, we believe that there was a lack of political will um, to, to look at closure of these factories because it is such a, a high-value industry. Um, in preparation for this uh, committee, uh, there's, there's a real dearth of data in relation to workers in this sector. Um, we asked the CSO 2016 for a special tabulation of data, um, which allowed us to see that there was 12,413 uh, workers in this sector. However, since that time, since 2017, 3,042 work permits have been issued, so it reveals that there's 15,338 uh, workers in this sector, um, and it's a migrant workforce that accounts for 58% of the sector, despite what has been told this House previously. 59% uh, of those are EU workers, 41% are EU workers, and 19% of those are unemployment permits. Um, the main nationalities are Polish, Lithuanian, Romanian, Latvian, Moldovan, Slovakian, Brazilian, South African, Botswana, and, and Filipino, so quite a range of, of, of countries. Um, EU workers and non-EU workers um, are overrepresented on the factory floor. Um, it's important to understand the different uh, contexts for EU and non-EU workers. EU workers have um, freedom of movement under EU law and full access to the labour market, where people from outside the EU require work permits to work. Um, workers are essentially tied to their employers. Um, it's difficult to change employment. Workers fear a loss of their immigration status because that's also um, tied to your, your work permit. Um, we've been working with people for nearly 20 years in the work permit system, um, and there's uh, uh, great fears of loss of, uh, of losing your immigration status, and it's very difficult for people to assert their rights, again, despite what has probably been said in this chamber previously. Um, um, we have long been calling for um, sectoral work permits to be put in place um, across a number of industries to allow for people to, to um, have better uh, freedom of movement. Um, in terms of working conditions, the meat sector is difficult, it's dangerous, um, uh, repetitive strain, workplace ac accidents are commonplace. Um, a, one recent um, award that was given, one recent prosecution in, in Cavan, uh, carried out by the HSA, awarded a, a worker just €2,000 for the loss of an eye. €2,000 for the loss of an eye. Very, very shocking. Um, so public data on the, uh, in the sector for workers, uh, the experience of workers in the sector is, is virtually non-existent. In preparation for this hearing um, over the last 10 days, we asked 68 workers from various meat factories across the country um, to provide some detail of their, of their working experience and working history and what uh, happened during the COVID uh, pandemic. Um, and uh, so it, it also kind of highlights the lack of uh, um, research done in this area. My, Breed, uh, my colleague, Breed McKeown, is going to take you through this now. Thank you. Over the past um, 10 days, we spoke to a range of workers from across um, seven or eight counties across Ireland. Um, the majority of people we spoke to were male, 29% female. Um, over 60% of these workers said that they were on 11.50 per hour or less, with four people saying they were on 10 euro 10 cent per hour, two of whom were um, 
uh, EU nationals, 15% of the people we interviewed um, said that they did not have a contract. A further 9% said they weren't sure whether they had a contract or not. Um, and 13% of the workers said that their contracts don't reflect their current terms and conditions. Almost a quarter of the workers said that they're not paid overtime whenever they work extra hours. And shockingly, 90% of the respondents said the employer does not provide a sick pay scheme, which, is which has been crucial during the COVID response. Um, re with regards to health and safety, almost 60% of workers said that they'd been injured in the workplace. The majority of injuries include regular lacerations, bruises, repetitive strain um, from years in the same role, back pain, and they claimed that injuries were caused by a lack of protective measures or equipment. None are limited training on health and safety um, and faulty tools and machinery, with almost a fifth of workers citing injury is an expected occupational hazard. 23% um, of the injuries went unreported. And over 60% of the workers said they didn't even know who the health and safety officer was in their workplace. We also asked workers if they felt valued in the workplace, and 85% of our respondents said they do not feel valued at work. 70% said they felt they had been bullied in some way, and of the people who have been bullied, a fifth of them felt too uh, afraid to raise their concerns. And moreover, three-fifths of the workers we spoke to felt they had been discriminated, um, mainly on the grounds of, of nationality or race. So kind of putting this in context of the COVID response, according to workers, there was an extremely mixed picture as to when protections were put in place. Um, this ranged from immediately, um, whenever lockdown occurred, right up to um, five weeks or more before measures were put in place um, in their workplaces. 43% of the respondents said that even where these measures were in place, they felt employers were not enforcing them sufficiently. And of the places where there were clusters, just 30% uh, of workers felt their employer had, took had taken effective action to keep them safe, with 67% claiming their employer had not done enough to prioritise their safety. 40% um, of the workers we interviewed still do not feel safe in their working environment. Um, and lastly, with regards to housing, um, there's very limited data on kind of housing available, but what our data showed is that 70% um, of the workers we interviewed do not live with co-workers. They live in a range of kind of family-owned individual rented and, and family-owned accommodation. And of the 28% of workers that do live with co-workers, they live with three or fewer co-workers. And just three of the people we interviewed um, said that they shared a room with a co-worker. Um, so just in terms of the employer response, MRCI began to receive complaints you know, from the 26th of March. Um, workers were extremely worried, frightened and angry about the conditions they were being forced to work in and could foresee that without appropriate health and safety measures, their family and their own health would be at risk. MRCI supported workers to raise their concerns with their employers. However, as we continued to receive ongoing complaints into May, it became clear that many factories were extremely slow to put in adequate safety, health and safety measures. We know that the meat sector is highly regulated in terms of meat production and food safety. However, the same attitude and approach has not been given to the working conditions of their staff. And it would seem that the state has allowed the meat industry to regulate itself, which we deem a questionable approach given the history we've outlined to you and the lack of value given to workers. To date, only one factory has closed to deal with the outbreak. Thank you, Ms. McKeown. Maybe um, highlight just uh, two further concerns, I suppose, in terms of the HSA and the HSE. Um, one in terms of contract tracing and uh, the gross. Um, violation of people's confidentiality when their data was shared with employers first rather than with the, the worker themselves when they were um, uh, when they had uh, tested positive for COVID-19. Um, this, this was a, 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 a very serious uh, breach of people's rights. Um, we were very concerned to hear uh, revelations made by uh, the Director of Public Health, um, which basically uh, showed us um, a level of racism, and, uh, institutional racism and discrimination, uh, which led to the serious uh, breach that it would essentially take too long to talk to workers in, through an interpreter to tell them that they had uh, COVID-19. Um, obviously, um, state agencies are bound by public sector duty and have a duty to provide equality of access to services. Um, so we're gravely and, and deeply concerned about this approach that was taken by the HSE. Uh, HSE. We're also deeply concerned about um, the approach taken by the HSA. Obviously, they received a number of complaints over, um, the, peer, over the month of April, yet nothing uh, no um, inspections were carried out until the week of the 19th. Indeed, no uh, sector 
specific guidelines were put in place until the 15th of May for this sector, a sector that was deemed essential from the outset. Um, surely a risk assessment should have been carried out. Surely some guidelines should have been put in place. Um, it is a sector where we know people work shoulder to shoulder. It's a high intensity, labour intensive sector. Um, and we were questioning the approach that was taken both by the Department of Agriculture, um, by the uh, part Department of Health and Jobs. Um, I suppose part of the problem with this is that there are a number of departments, it's, a, it's an interdepartmental issue um, and um, you know, it's, it seems to be falling between a, a, few, a, few, a few stools. Um, so again, we would very much um, welcome um, if, if there are more outbreaks, um, again, we'd be calling for the closure of plants. And that didn't happen, as we said, just in, in one case that happened. Uh, we'd equally like to see a task force set up to look at terms of conditions for workers in the sector um, and examine state funding and where that goes to the sector. Um, to increase pay for workers and at a very minimum to be given a bonus to workers who provided uh, this essential work during this period of time. Um, and for labour inspectors um, and inspectors from the HSA to carry out unannounced inspections. One of the big problems was when inspections are being carried out, they're announced, um, nothing is found, people can scarper across the floor, um, workers are told to make themselves scarce, um, and, and, and workers are in the dark as to what happens then in, in terms of the outcome from those, those, um, those inspections. Um, so thank you very much. We very much welcome your questions. Thank you very much, Ms. McGinley. Um, the first speaker is from Fine Gael, uh, Deputy Cullen Burke. Um, Are you taking five minutes or ten? Um, I'll take ten. Go ahead. That's okay. Well, I may not use the ten, but I'll yeah, take it. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, can I just deal with one or two issues that you have raised in your statement? Um, first of all, in relation to the disclosure to employers about um, that um, workers had uh, identified as positive. Is there any evidence that the HSE were having difficulty in that if they told an employee that they had identified positive, that the employee then was still going into work um, even though they had been identified as positive? And is, was, have the HSE given an explanation as to why um, they went directly to the employers? Um. In terms of um, disclosures to employees, I think as I, as I uh, outlined, um, it was very much, um, I, I think, trying to cut corners in some, in some respects. Um, if employees were still going into work, I don't have data on that and I, I, I don't but have... But have you looked for an explanation from the HSC as to why they went directly to the employers? Have we looked for... Yes. Um, no, we haven't. So there isn't an explanation as to why it was uh, the, the information was disclosed to employers first rather than to the employees first. N no, not I don't have that information. Uh, would you accept that if, if someone was identified as being positive and didn't take advice, having been identified positive, that there was a duty of care that employers should have been notified? I, we, we, I don't think we have a problem with employers being notified. I think what the problem is that the employee wasn't notified first. So yeah. it's their data, it's their information, it's their health. So the problem is not that the employer was actually informed. The problem is that the worker it, themselves were not informed first, but, that a step was skipped. Okay, but did you correspond with the HSC on this matter? We haven't corresponded with the HSE on this matter, no. But I think, wouldn't it be wise, and maybe the committee might correspond with the HSE on this matter as regards, because I don't think we've give, been given an explanation as to why the employers were notified first. I think it's an important issue. So maybe the committee might correspond with the HSE in this matter. That's a reasonable suggestion. Okay. I, I think some explanations were given in the chamber, but not in this committee. Yeah. But I don't think there was a full explanation no, given. I, no, I accept your suggestion, yep. Deputy Broke. Okay. It's a very good one. Thanks. Yes. Um, the the second issue that I, that I want to 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 raise is in relation to um, we've got a submission in from the uh, from the meat industry sector saying that they um, were dealing with their members from and I think there's about 50 plants around the country um, that they were dealing with their members from the 12th of March on and that ever before the HSE contacted them that they were putting measures in place. Have you seen any evidence that measures of any description were put in place from the 12th of March on? Um, Breed, do you want to take that question? 
Sure, yeah. Um, yeah, we have seen some evidence in some workplaces that uh, employers were very quick to uh, put in place uh, COVID measurements um, of our respondents in the last 10 days. Um, around a quarter of the respondents said that their workplace had put in measures um, during the first week uh, of lockdown. But I think what um, we have seen from this evidence and also wider um, from anecdotal evidence beyond um, this data poll is that there was a very inconsistent approach. So some employers put in place measures in the first week of lockdown and some put in um, measures six weeks later, unnecessarily exposing uh, workers to COVID. Okay, and, and there are, I think there are around 50 plants around the country uh, dealing with meat processing and they're owned by different groups. Was there a clear difference in approach by the groups or did it depend on the factories themselves as regards who was managing the factories that the different approach was, was coming from? I don't think we have um, sufficient data to put it down to a specific company um, or a specific area or a specific type of factory. But okay. it is my understanding that some factories are that putting measures in place would be easier in some factories than others due to the, um, you know, how old the factory but is. But there isn't the a clear is definition between, say, if you have a, a group that owns six factories and they adopted the same approach across those six factories, whereas other groups, it depended on who was managing the factory as opposed to the, the, the company that owned the factories. Yeah, I would say it was a mixture of those. Mm. It was I, a mixture of... I think it's a very individualised approach to, to how these measures were put in place. I mean, we only saw one factory actually close down in all the time when there was a, a, an outbreak, which was very welcome, you know, that they took that, that, they took that approach um, to protect their workers. Um, and then the, the rest, it, it, it's, it's a very, very, very mixed picture. And you can't, uh, unfortunately, we can't blanket and say everybody did one thing and, one, and did another. Okay. Can I just go on to the issue which you raised in your report? And that's, and I know you didn't refer to it this morning, but it is an important issue about some um, people working in meat factories are employed by agencies as opposed to employed by the factories. How uh, wide a problem is that? Um, that people are employed by agencies as opposed and what new problems is that creating uh, for the workers? Um, I would say the majority of workers are employed directly uh, by their employer. I think the issue around agency workers is an emerging issue, um, mainly worked on by the Independent Workers Union um, in Cork and they're seeing that across different sectors, not just meat. Um, some of the problems with um, agency workers are that um, Often their rights um, are, you know, very much controlled by the agency. So they live in agency-provided accommodation. During COVID, they were threatened with eviction if they um, raised issues around um, their health and safety concerns or just general working conditions. Um, uh, and but are we are we talking about one particular area in the country where this is an issue, or is it across the entire country? I wouldn't know. I think the only reports that we have heard have been. Um, yeah, from the southwest. We, we don't think it's a, a widespread issue, but it is an issue, and I think it's something that needs to be addressed. And, and uh, I think it's something that this committee could 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 also look at. And in relation to the rights of people who uh, who are employed by an agency as opposed to by the factory itself, uh, obviously their 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 rights are not the same. Uh, can we identify what needs to be done in this area now um, to make sure that people have? the same rights whether they're employed by an agency or whether they're employed by the owner of the factory directly? I mean, good practice in terms of, um, you know, workers would be direct employment. Um, I think it's something that shouldn't be um, allowed in the sector. It's, it, it allows for um, a further um, um, uh, denigration of people's rights um, and, and entitlements and um, I think it's a practice that needs to be stamped out and shouldn't be tolerated in this sector. So I think a very simple met a message would be that, that this, is, this is not the way to go and this is not the way to employ workers in this industry. Okay, and can I finally say that the report back from the employers is that something like 97% of workers have returned to work. Would that be your own evidence on this issue? Are, uh, and is there any follow-on problems that have arisen in relation to people while they were out um, because of COVID, um, loss of earnings, loss of holiday pay? Is there any evidence that that has occurred in, in, in your own, from your own investigation? 
In, in terms of uh, people, there was a, there was a lot of misunderstanding. Um, again, as we as, as we told you, there ninety percent of people aren't covered by any sick pay scheme. So there's a lot of misunderstanding about uh, qualifying for sick pay. If you had sick pay, how you claim it? Um, that was difficult for people. Uh, the majority of people we work with are actually back in work and have been back in work um, a long time. Um, most people we work with have been working all the time. Um, I think part of the, the, the scandal in this is that workers haven't been given any extra pay throughout this period. They've been working in a very uh, difficult and hard environment. Um, we as a country expected them to, uh, to step up and provide essential work and their employers haven't valued this in any way. Um, and I think that's, that's something that needs to be addressed. Uh, and finally, just the employers are telling us that they have now provided guidance in, in relation to the language, in the, in the language that the people are, uh, are, uh, speak. Uh, I think it's something about 10 different languages that, you know, because people are coming from a, a number of different countries, have you seen clear evidence that uh, the proper translation has occurred in relation to guidance and health and safety and all that, that, that all that information is in the language of the uh, country where the person has come from? I, I think it's well and good to um, provide uh, some, you know, health and safety measures in the language people can understand, but you have to have training in it. There has to be consistent training, there has to be monitoring, there has to be uh, communication with staff. Part of the problem, I think, has been a lack of communication uh, between management and workers, um, and that's something that, that, that has been consistent in the past. Um, as you heard, uh, uh, 60, over 60% 60 don't even know who the health and safety officer is in their place of work. Um, so there's a real problem in terms of um, communication, connection, consultation um, with workers in terms of uh, protecting them and keeping them safe. So yes, it's important that um, uh, language information is in people's languages, and I don't have a, an exact uh, figure of how many uh, they are, but actually making that real, making that real for people in their workplace, what does that look like? Okay. We don't have figures on that, okay. and it would be really important to understand how many trainings have been carried out, with whom, um, wh what people were involved in that. So okay. it's, it's a whole, it, it, it's a big piece of work, I think, that has to happen. It needs investment. Um, I think we're really talking about investment in workers here, and this is what's been lacking previous to this and throughout the whole, the, the whole time. Okay, thank you very much, Neat. Very much, Deputy Burke. Just one quick follow-up question uh, to, to Deputy Burke for moving on. Um, we, we received very helpful submissions from um, ICTU and also from um, uh, the uh, Independent Workers' Union um, on the issue of the varying reactions at various times in various meat plants. Uh, the Independent Workers' Union said, in one meat plant on the first day of lockdown, the doors to the women's locker rooms and toilets were bolted open to the wall without prior notice. According to management, this was done so that the female employees wouldn't touch the doors. However, these facilities opened into the main hallway and women felt humiliated and dehumanised, being forced to change in full sight of all passers-by, all in the interests of health and safety. Uh, in your survey, did you come across anything like that? Um, well, I think in our, uh, in the people that we work with, um, they would experience kind of day-to-day -day, uh, discrimination and bullying. And I think that uh, whenever I read that in the Independent Workers Union report, I wasn't surprised to hear it. So no, we didn't come across any um, particular... Uh, but you didn't come across anybody who had enc encountered this particular practice or any practice like it? Not that particular practice, no. Thanks very much. Uh, from Fianna Fáil, uh, Deputy Devlin, uh, are you speaking for 10 minutes? Yes, I am, Chair. Thank you very thank much. You. And uh, thank you to Ms. Uh, McGinley and Ms. McKeown for uh, your attendance today and for your contribution and opening statements. It's much appreciated and enlightening. Um, this is an issue, as you're well aware, uh, that came to public prominence at the outset of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, it's one that, in my own constituency, we don't have meat processing plants. Uh, it doesn't directly affect um, my own area. But that's not, you know, a reason to be here or not be here. Uh, I welcome the fact that you're here. I think this is a very good forum to air the issues that you have highlighted here. I would go as far to say that this is not, unfortunately, um, isolated to meat, pa meat processing or any type of industry. In fact, I would take it from the point of view of the work permits, which you touched on uh, in your remarks. 
Um, I think the, the, the reform needs to happen about um, permits, um, because as you highlighted in your own uh, remarks there, that you know, the, very much the employee is attached to the employer, and that in itself brings issues. Um, fine if the employer is a good employer, but where we're discussing the not so good, uh, then there's a huge problem there, and, uh, and that needs to be dealt with um, across the board. You might just elaborate, though, uh, in, your, in your answers to me about the sector of work permits. What do you envisage uh, as that, um, particularly for, uh, as you highlight, about non-EU um, workers? Um, you also touched on the HSA inspections. Are you aware of how many were carried out during the height of the pandemic? Bearing in mind that I think you gave a date of about the 15th um, was when the guidelines were issued. But just on the guidelines, we're talking about people who feel isolated and feel cut off and almost beholden to the employer or to the business that they work for. Were those guidelines issued in different languages? Are you aware? I'm not aware, but that's why I'm asking yourselves. Um, and maybe just you might answer those questions, and I might come in chair uh, with some others, please. Um, yeah, thank you, Deputy, for, for those questions. Um, in terms of work permits, I, it, we've been we've been calling for sectoral work permits for mobility. It's essentially for mobility yeah. for workers, so that if there are problems um, with certain in their employment, so if there's exploitation, um, if there's health and safety issues, um, that they have the freedom to move employer and they don't have to go through a whole process of reapplying for a work permit, costs a thousand euros. It's, it's, a very, it, it's quite a complex um, situation. So a sectoral work permit would basically be um, where you'd be giving, um, it, might, it could be the meat and it could be the agri sector, um, for example, so that might include horticulture, it might include um, um, mushrooms and fruit picking and, um, and, and meat, um, and that you can work throughout that sector. The same with hospitality, for example, the same with, um, um, with uh, care, with nursing homes, with other kind of, um, and I know you've uh, examined that in, in detail. This is about giving the employee power to move should, should, should something be wrong. Um, so that's, that, that, that's something, and um, we'd be very happy to work on that. In terms of HSA inspections, my understanding is that there was seven, that inspections have been carried out now, and we have spoken to, to workers, to the, to the um, there has been a suite of inspections. I don't actually have the figure of that right now. Um, when we talked to workers, they knew an inspection was coming because there was a flurry of activity. Um, marks were put on the floors, um, everything, you know, the COVID signs were put up outside. Um, so this this approach to unannounced uh, uh, inspections is a very flawed one, um, and uh, so so we I think that's we think that's problematic. Um, in terms of the guidelines that on 15th of May in different languages, I would uh, I haven't seen it either, um, and I don't know if workers were made aware that new guidelines were actually put in place. We told the people we were working with, um, you know, so I wouldn't say, I would say no. Well, just on that point, I mean, that's, that's uh, look, I commend the work you're doing um, because without you, uh, many of these people would absolutely be voiceless um, and they would feel vulnerable. Um, so I think it's really important that you're able to uh, voice those concerns in which they have. Um, like, I, I, I haven't visited ME, packing uh, or processing plant, um, but I would hope that the signage in which we're all now familiar with, the yellow signage, which is right here beside me, uh, and everywhere everywhere you go, you would hope that it was a, a multilingual um, and that there was advice particularly uh, for these type of industries. Um, but in saying that, and, and quoting from your report, you said the CSO figure for 2016, were, there was 12,413 employees in the sector. Um, and that's a, a equate to about 42% of migrant workers. But then when you add in the work permits on top of that, you estimate to be about 15,338 employees, which is 58% of the sector. So we're talking about quite a high volume of individuals uh, who are potentially low skilled, low paid. Um, and what I said at the outset about the prominence of meatpacking industry uh, being almost like a cluster for uh, COVID, um, I think, Maybe it was an incorrect portrayal of that, but certainly the public 
psyche was that there was a lot of issues in meatpacking plants. And my concern now is that if the inspections are, may, are announced, well, like anybody who's involved in the hospitality industry never gets an advance notice of a health inspector coming in, and rightly so. And because you need to see warts and all, you need to be able to address those concerns. And I am very worried uh, if advanced inspections are happening, because then we're not going to get to the root of the problem. Um, and then following on from that, because of the individuals being low paid, um, you know, I, I was surprised about the figures you have around accommodation for those individuals, because anecdotally, I would imagine that a lot of people who are low paid or work are living together and therefore that would almost account for more of the cluster than the workplace. Um, but look, I hope this isn't the uh, last time that we get to engage. Uh, I would hope that there would be reform, uh, much of the reform you're looking for, that we could achieve that. Um, but I really appreciate your time and your comments here today. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Devlin. Um, the next speaker, Sorry, did you want to come back in, Ms. McGinley? On, on any I, I was, I was just going to Devlin maybe just say that it well, actually it is doing. quite a high skilled uh, uh, sector, and some you know to be a, a boner and a cutter and a butcher, and you know it, it requires a lot of skill, um, and the remuneration I think that is is given to 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 these the, the these skilled uh, the skilled work isn't isn't appropriate. Okay. Thanks. So, on the issue of sectoral, uh, and you're you're suggesting that sectoral permits. Might, might improve the situation. Um, but I suppose farmers typically complain that there's a very little variance in how they're treated between one meat plant and another. Mm. Um, do you, is there a, a great variance in how workers are treated across meat plants in your experience? Um, I, 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 I would I'll ask Bree to come in, but I would say no. I think there's very much a uh, very similar approach to workers across meat. Uh, so how would a sectoral... Meat. I mean, I, I appreciate the general uh, advantage of sectoral employment permits yeah. in all areas. Yeah, but, yeah. But how would it benefit, do you think, individual workers in meat plants if they had a sector? I, I mean, if it's a, are they not being left with a choice of going from the frying pan into the fire? I mean, they leave one employer and they get, you know... Well, I think you're not a sitting duck. So you can, you can begin to negotiate better okay. terms and conditions. So if there's a, a lot of people who are trying to move and negotiate better terms and conditions, by its very nature, uh, you raise the standards. Um, I, I do believe there needs to be better, um, e even a sectoral agreement for this, uh, this area, more, more generally, you know, to set terms and conditions of employment. I know that ICTU um, have been calling for that as well, and that's something we would support. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Then Deputy Carthy, thank you. Um, thank you for the work that you have been doing and for your presentations here this morning. We have received a report that was compiled by Dr Mannix um, for NEFET that was um, provided to them, I understand, on the 3rd of June. And I quote from it, the department um, are not currently aware of any plant where their staff have any significant concerns in relation to lack of compliance or inaction on the part of food business operators in respect of compliance um, with the NOCT guidelines. Clearly, what you have said contradicts that. Am I correct in saying that? Yeah. Why, how do you think it is possible that the Department of Food and Marine were not aware of any concerns regarding any specific plant? This is the 3rd of June bear in mind, at a time when probably the media profile of this issue was at its highest. How would it be possible that someone could compile a report for an effort, an official report for an effort, and say that the department aren't aware of any concerns regarding individual plans? I wish I knew the answer to that. Um, I think it is astonishing that that, that is in the report, given that given the the just the existence of clusters from, you know, from a very basic level, um, but then also the, um, uh, all of the work that we're doing with workers and, and hearing from workers, and, and you can see from the stats, the, you know, we, still five, week on, for five weeks on, there wasn't um, um, you know, proper protections in place. My understanding is that there are representatives from the Department of Culture or of Agriculture, um, you know, present in, in, in meat factories. So you would assume um, that 
some information should be passed on, um, although it hasn't been. So, uh, unfortunately, I don't. Have well, an that same to it. report, as well as the Meat Industry Ireland's submission here today, actually commends the Meat Industry for their adoption of procedures to protect workers. But your evidence. The submission we received from SIPTU and others reports that some employers ignored completely the recommendations of the HSE. So who's lying to who here? How are we getting to a point where we have such workers' representatives saying one thing and um, official reports being presented to NEFET saying the exact opposite? Um, I, I don't want to call anybody a liar, um, but um, I think there may have been incomplete um, information uh, provided to the HSA to even make um, so, some kind of a, an assessment of it. Um, I think you can only rely, as I say, on the figures that have come out in terms of the, the outbreaks um, of COVID, and that, that in, a, in and of itself tells its own story. Um, so I think the right questions were probably not asked. Maybe the right inspections weren't carried out. Um, there wasn't communication between departments, which we know is always a problem in terms of inter interdepartmental responsibility, where there are different responsibilities for different aspects of this industry. Chairman, that report also states in the report to NEFET that the decision of the HSE to convey test results to employers in meat plants was actually in line with legislation. In other words, it was, it was a legal practice. So to ask a broader question in relation to your work, are you aware of any other industry where employers were informed of the test results regarding the health status of their employees before the workers themselves? No. Um, I, do you, would you have offhand an instance of how many instances, or would you have that information? Because, as was mentioned earlier, we have asked the HSE, but haven't got um, the response in terms of how many individual workers or how many individual plants that that scenario occurred. Do you know I, that? I, I don't sure? have detail of that, no. Okay. Um, your report, it, it, it seems to me bizarre that we're relying on census information to try and get a sense of exactly what proportion of the workforce within um, meat plants is um, coming from migrant commun communities. I see Meat Industry Ireland refer to their migrant workforce as people from outside of the EU. Um, I'm not sure if any of them were working in Poland that they'd consider themselves domestic workers um, the, the, themselves. Um, but just, um, and perhaps Ms. McKeown might have the information to this, um, would it be fair to say that it is over 50% in terms of general operators within meat plants from the experience, your experience that would be from a migrant background? Yeah, I mean, I would um, say that people from an EU and non-EU background are overrepresented on factory floors. Sorry, so I didn't catch that. Under are underrepresented or overrepresented. Sorry, on the factory floors. So even if you see, say, 100% of the workforce, you have 58% from a migrant background, um, and 42% from an Irish background, you're more likely to see a higher percentage of uh, migrant workers on the factory floor, um, in the lowest paid in the lowest paid positions. Um. With regard to that, then, would you have a sense of how, what proportion of management would be from a migrant background, from middle and upper management levels? Um, in terms of the data, so um, CSO uh, census data 2016, it, it doesn't, it collects occupations. It's very, very difficult um, to actually break it down into occupations because there's so many and they're collected in very different ways. Unfortunately, the Labour Force survey, which is one of our, our better surveys, doesn't collect this data at a, a low enough level to drill into that. So really, we only have top line data. What we'd really need to see is a special um, module conducted by the CSO to look at this industry in particular and um, to try and drill down into it. Um, the, the, I mean, that is something the committee could request in terms of a special module um, to look at the sector in more, more in depth um, the, and the CSO could, could look at that, but that would be kind of survey data. Um, that is ultimately so important. Um, and we're relying on 2016 data, our labour force survey, and the business, um, uh, uh, I can't remember the name of it, the business data uh, survey yeah. also doesn't um, collect it. So it will be something that will be really, really good to have. 
I would propose, Gearlock, that the working group would consider um, that we would send that correspondence to the C CSO as a recommendation that they would um, conduct yeah. that type of. Um, sorry, do you have even? Well, certainly, we we'll consider that. I mean, yes, thank mm. you. Um, would you have um, any even anecdotal evidence as to suggest what proportion of the workers that you have encountered will be members of trade unions? Um, I, 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 I don't know the figure, but Breed, maybe you want to come in on that. Um, yeah, I, I'm not sure I would know the figure. There's, um, yeah, I'm just trying to think. Sorry, uh, there are there is kind of a low density of union members across factories. So SIPTU would have members um, across a lot of different factories across Ireland, but not necessarily enough uh, to be recognised with the employer. Okay, um, and then just in relation to specific cases, if you can say whether or not you're aware of any instances where workers went back to work, haven't been tested, but before the test results were actually conveyed to them? No, I know that um, we had anecdotal evidence from workers to say um, that they had been tested, that their employer had been told the results, and only when they went to ask their employer a few days later were they told the results. Um, and we, we had some anecdotal evidence, though we don't have um, a huge number, of, a huge amount of data on this, um, that uh, some employers, the feeling was that they were withholding um, positive results from uh, workers who were not uh, displaying symptoms to keep up production. Production efforts, but as I say, we don't have you know firm evidence on that. And I'm sorry for asking you these questions. Um, the reason we're asking because the information you've provided us is more comprehensive than we've been able to ascertain from of official sources. So there's clearly gaps here, um, Kehirlock, um, and I think you know, we need to revert back. I know we have a, another session in the afternoon, but I absolutely think that we should invite Dr. Mannix. Um, to a future hearing, and I also believe that we should be inviting the union representatives to come along, um, because I think they might have a perspective that we've seen from their written submissions that would be incredibly useful to delve in further. The um, final point that I will make um, in relation to the closure of factories um, that will, I hope, provide some relief to you um, in terms of future outbreaks that are now current. Taoiseach, only a few short weeks ago, on May the 14th, um, actually called for factories to be closed in advance of a deep clean in the event of any factories where outbreaks occur. So I'm sure that will um, um, be of assistance um, to us all um, as, as we move forward. So just go Thanks. Just Deputy Carthy, I, I'd agree with you on the utility of a further meeting. It is, of course, in the hands of the business committee. Your party have a representative on that. I'll be talking well, to him. Very good. Um, the next speaker is from the uh, Labour Party, Deputy Duncan Smith. Chair, just before I address the witnesses, I'd just like to again also call for a future session uh, in the near future in which the trade unions will be invited uh, on this specific issue. Um, just, uh, on that point, I mean, we received a very useful submission from the Congress of Trade Unions, and also I've read um, uh, an interesting report from the European Federation of Food, Agriculture and Tourism Trade Unions, the SIP2 contributed heavily to. I completely yeah. agree with you. You're I know, just, and in their submission, they offered to come in. Uh, the, the reason what we're seeing here, we're not for MRCI and the work of the unions. We would not have any information about what's going on inside these meat plants. In what I'm interpreting as, and many people are interpreting as, uh, the largest systemic worker exploitation that's happening in the state at the moment. We had a session here a couple of weeks ago where it became clear that you are most likely to contract COVID in three areas, in a healthcare setting, in a nursing home, and in a meat plant. And whilst there was issues with, all, with, with, with healthcare settings and nursing homes, at least we can point to the fact that the state went and flew planes over to China to get PPE for uh, our, our acute hospitals. We know the army delivered PPE to nursing homes, including private nursing homes. So my question, one of my questions to the MRCI, and to thank them again for all the work they've been doing, all the data they've been providing us, not for this session, not just for this session, but for sessions that we've had with the Minister for Agriculture a few weeks ago. Were there, was there any instances where the state provided uh, protective equipment or any extra equipment to workers in meat plants? Because it is my view 
that not only have many employers let these workers down, but that the state have abandoned the workers in these plants to this uh, awful, awful virus. And just a second uh, question to uh, uh, Bree McKeown, if possible. Uh, you mentioned that the contracts don't reflect their terms and conditions. If you could just expand again that, like every contribution you're both making, there's just another example of something horrific that's going on in, in, uh, from a worker's perspective in these plants. So if you could just provide more details on that. And secondly, um, these interviews you've done most recently and previous interviews you've done, I understand there's massive barriers just even to getting to meet these workers. So if you could expand again on what type of barriers are put in your place, in so much as you can, um, I, but by the employers, I'd really appreciate it. Sure, thank you. Yeah, and I completely agree um, with regards uh, your your comments around PPE. And I think our, one of our questions would be, if meat factories were deemed um, an essential place uh, to remain open during COVID, kind of where was the risk assessment and preparation to make workers safe at the beginning of the outbreak? Um, with regards to the specific question, the specific question around terms and conditions. So, 15% of the people we spoke to didn't have contracts. 9% weren't sure if they had contracts, and then um, a, a further 13% uh, said their their contracts didn't reflect their terms and conditions so where we're seeing that the most is really with workers who've been there for you know 10 15 years who had contracts that reflect their conditions whenever they began to work that they signed you know potentially in their home country you know Botswana South Africa um, and they've been here for years without any kind of um, change in their employment standards at uh, the amount that they're valued or any opportunity for, for progression or promotion um, and we heard recent reports over the past year to two years that uh, workers are being given you know new contracts on the factory floor and being asked to sign them you know without it the, with them being in english without them being translated or explained um and and kind of intimidation when there's resistance to signing contracts um and then just to speak uh, about the barriers that we that we face i mean we've worked for the past year and a half to build up relationships with migrant workers from these sectors you know they're extremely maltreated um poorly treated there's a day-to-day -day kind of lack of respect and value bestowed and a huge lack of trust uh, from workers to any kind of um, authorities or, um, or, or outsiders. So it's taken us um, a lot of time uh, to build up trustworthy relationships. And then from that, we've been able to establish um, relationships with groups of workers in different parts of the, of the country and connect workers together. And I think that's helped workers feel less isolated. So uh, one of the key barriers is, is obviously language. Um, access to resources, access to information about uh, their employment rights. Um, there was a suite of um, things promised whenever the meat sector work permits were uh, introduced around uh, responsibilities for the employer to provide ESOL uh, and to provide um, a series of information sessions or, or kind of resources around your employment rights and, and to date MRCI doesn't know if this is if this has been delivered um, you know so there's a huge I would say the main barriers are language kind of trust um, and yeah I guess as well division of workers so setting you know workers up against each other um, kind of in the workplace so it's, we've done a lot of work to, to bring people together from different backgrounds and um, to kind of show solidarity Again, when we had a debate with the Minister for Agriculture uh, a few weeks ago now, uh, where he was the previous Minister for Agriculture, who was very defensive, borderline aggressive in his responses, um, he told me in a response that I was entitled to my own opinions but not entitled to my own facts. And that, that was when I was referencing um, the figures that yourself and the trade unions were putting together. Why, in your opinion, uh, which I trust, by the way, knowing the individuals behind it and how these figures were, were data, I trust your figures 100%, especially as when the government came back, they had no backup to the figures that they were offering. Um, why are they so defensive, do you think, about uh, th their figures in terms of migrant workers in this sector? Uh, and why do you think they are so opaque in terms of uh, their numbers? Adele, do you want to... Um... <laughs> Did you want the long or the short answer? Um, Once we, we'll take the long answer. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, why are they so opaque? Uh, it, it, it's, it's hard to know. I mean, obviously you need to go back to the, 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 the value added in this industry. You know, the amount of money that is produced in this industry, the amount of profit that's generated in this industry, the amount of tax um, that's generated in this industry. Um, the, vested the vested interests in this industry as well. So I think you have to look at the, the bigger picture. Um, in terms of, I, 
I would imagine they don't want to be seen as being a, a sector that's, um, that is dependent on migrant labour um, and want to paint it as a sector that still is, uh, is, it has, has a lot of Irish workers in it. And there are Irish workers in, in this sector also treated poorly and badly, also on low pay. So I think it's really important to, to, remember, to remember that um, uh, 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 also. Um, I, I'm not sure why they tried to up, 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 up oh, I can't say that word, um, to <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the figures. Yeah. Um, it, it, it doesn't really make sense to me. It's really important that we know who, who is in the industry. Um, it's, it's not a bad thing, you know, to, to know if migrant workers are here. It's not a bad thing to know if migrant workers are on work permits. We need to know so that we know the vulnerabilities in, in the sector. But I think it is, um, um, we, there was very little scrutiny, I think, in terms of um, how um, the meat industry really got, um, you know, made arguments for additional work permits to, to be made. I suppose you, you, have to, you have to look at also um, the amount of exports that, that are being made. We supply an awful lot of meat to, to Europe and indeed to, to, to other countries now. So as that grows, there's a corresponding demand for workers. Um, and I don't think there's enough transparency in the correlation between um, the amount of exports and the demand for workers. So I think that's something that would probably need to be looked at a bit more as well, because uh, I don't have the detail on that. But, um, you know, yeah, there... No, thank, yeah, yeah. yeah, thank you, and thank you for your work on that. Sure. Thanks very much. Um, I suppose... One of the arguments made against, in favour of processing in Ireland and against live exports, one of the economic arguments, there are of course other arguments, but one of the economic arguments is the number of jobs being created in Ireland and if those jobs are being filled by migrant workers, maybe it's seen to dimin diminish that argument. I, I, I don't know, but it's an interesting point that you make. Um, the next speaker is... Um, I, just Deputy to say, I don't think it should be jobs at all cost. You know, in terms of people's work, um, you know, protections and rights and entitlements, it shouldn't be the lowest common denominator for jobs. If jobs are created, that's great, but they need to be quality jobs. No, no, no I, yeah. I accept that, that argument. I'm just saying that's one of the arguments that's made. Yeah, yeah. Uh, De Deputy uh, Kearns uh, of the Social Democrats. Thank you, Chair, and thank you both. Um, and thanks especially for highlighting the kind of bigger picture there with regard to vested interests and I suppose the value of those exports. Uh, comparatively to the value of the staff, how staff are valued in the sector. Um, I think the pandemic highlighted many of the social uh, injustices in our society and the erosion of the state's role in recent years, which leaves vulnerable groups exposed to increased risk. Um, it's evident in nursing home direct provisions, and two in this case. Um, the scale of the, the outbreaks in meat processing plants uh, illustrated the harrowing underlying issues in the sector. Um, we're all aware of the unsustainable low prices that farmers have received from them. Um, and now a clearer picture has been painted of the conditions that workers endure there too. Um, we have to consider, um, like you said, if the large amount of migrants in this sector contributed to the conditions that facilitate the outbreaks. Um, a few weeks ago, the then Minister for Business, Heather Humphreys, assured me that migrant workers in this area, and I quote, have the exact same right, rights as all Irish workers. Um, subsequently, after several questions to that department, I learned that 2000, since 2015, 622 migrant workers have been issued general employment permits, which fall into the Stamp 1 immigration category, meaning they have greatly reduced access to social welfare and other related supports. Um, in addition, uh, Ms McGinley's submission shows us that conditions attached to immigration status creates vulnerabilities and challenges for workers who are in effect tied to their employers. Um, your submission has a number of excellent recommendations that this committee and government should act on. Um, further to those, I wonder could you suggest reforms to our immigration system that would help strengthen the rights and capacities um, of migrants and their families? This is the first question. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. Um, in terms of um, uh, workers being on work permits. Uh, I would disagree with um, the assertion in, in the chamber uh, um, around um, 
Yes, everybody has the same rights, but everybody doesn't have the same ability to claim their rights. Um, there's certain sets of circumstances that um, impact on a person's ability to actually claim and enforce their rights. Um, whether that might be access to information, it might be um, um, kind of fear in, in a sector, fear of loss of employment um, and fear of losing your immigration status. I cannot overstate how much that fear impacts on people uh, asserting and claiming their rights. Um, in terms of reform of the immigration system, I did say sectoral permits. If you wanted to go for a gold standard, I would say green, um, uh, they're, they're called green cards. So where a person is, um, you uh, uh, have access to the labour market. It's very similar to nurses, for example. So for two years, um, you're, you work in the, in the sector where you are, but then after two years, you have full access to the labour market. You have a complete different set of rights. Um, so I think, um, you know, that is then for, that, for those two years, it is specific to, to, to a sector, by the way, as well. So the gold standard is, 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 is the green card, um, and, um, and that's what we would like to see. A subsector of that is, 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 the, um, is the sectoral permits, and I'm very happy to supply other more detailed information on that to any uh, deputy who'd like to see that because I think there's there's a few things in that and we'd be happy to write up something for you on that. That'd be great, something maybe the committee could consider furthering. Um, thank you so much. The, the other thing I want to raise is the, the Black Lives Matter movement um, and long overdue conversations about racism in Ireland have also gained prominence recently. Um, your report highlights issues around institutional racism and discrimination suffered by workers. Um, given that this House was mostly united in our desire for action on racism in Ireland and abroad, I'm wondering if there are key recommendations that you'd have for us. Um, I know it's a, a long and complex issue and we, we are tight in time, but like the others, I'd really appreciate any documents or anything like that could be sent on. Um, and just because the time is tight, I'll just put this in at the end. Um, your recommendation stresses the importance of inspections. Um, I'm just wondering if you can elaborate on the necessity of properly unannounced labour and health and safety inspections by state authorities and meat plants. Thank you. Um, unannounced inspections. Um, I think on, on both levels for labour inspectors um, and for the HSA, I, I think I've made reference to it already. It, 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 it can't be overestimated how important these are because um, if, if you give people time to tidy up, hide, brush under the carpet, whatever it is that happens, um, you know, get workers out of the way who may be troublemakers, um, give them a day off <laughs> um, so that they won't say anything. This was part of the problem, I think, with, with inspections is the lack of consultation and communication with workers. So we rely predominantly on a management or our owner's um, compliance. In fairness, probably to the, the, the Labour inspectorate, they can only inspect records. Um, so really, you know, there, there is limitations. There's also a lot of limitations in terms of um, having adequate resources to do proper um, intelligence gathering and proper inspections and enforcement. Um, in, but they need to happen. Workers need to be talked to. Um, and, worker, and, and that takes time. If you, if, uh, building on what, what Breed has said, if, if there's such a distrust of authorities um, and they've been people have been failed over and over and over again, um, it's going to take time to actually talk to a worker, to, to build some trust, to um, generate the evidence um, that, that a state body needs in order to, to, to make proper recommendations. So, it, it is something that needs time and it, it, it does need investment in and it probably needs a different it needs a different approach. Chair, can I just ask you, sorry, is there a role that the, this committee can make in ensuring that these proper kind of really necessary inspections are carried out in that way? We can make recommendations. That's the extent I mean we can't obviously go and carry out, you know, inspections or anything, but we can certainly make recommendations, recommendations to changes in legislation uh, and also recommendations, I presume, in, in changes to, to practices by state agencies. It would be great if we could do that then. Well, you're, you're welcome to Thank join you. us when we're writing the report. Great. Thanks very much, Deputy Cairns. Thank you. Um, uh, Debbie Murphy. Yeah, firstly, thanks really a lot to the MRCI for your work on this. Um, I think what you have outlined is really a case of 
criminal neglect by the state, um, and that's in terms of health and in terms of workers' rights. And I just hope that this, what is a major scandal in terms of the treatment of these workers in relation to COVID-19, serves as a wake-up call for the treatment um, going into the, to the future. Um, so the first question I have, just not to just have exactly the same questions as the other people, um, is, um, I mean, when I spoke to people connected to the industry, um, I heard cases of workers taking paracetamol to bring their temperatures down so that they wouldn't show up on, if they had scans on the way in. And that was linked to a culture of fear that exists in the meat factories and the absence of sick pay. So you've highlighted that 90% of workers here don't have um, sick pay. Are they things that you heard of and are they the kind of reasons that that, that was happening? Reed, do you want to answer that? Yeah, I would absolutely agree with that. I think, I think the, the lack of sick pay um, during such a crucial time absolutely would contribute to any kind of decision if you are in low wage employment um, and you, you know, you're, you're working in a kind of intimidated, um, an intimidating environment where you are um, you know, threatened during that time, of course you're going, uh, you know, you could potentially kind of act uh, to maintain your job in, in the absence of sick pay. But, to, you know, to be honest, we, we haven't heard a huge number of reports around that. A lot of workers were actually just very concerned for their own safety, uh, their colleagues' safety, um, and their own family's safety. Um, and, and that was paramount for people. Specifically, sorry, the suggestion or allegation regarding um, workers taking paracetamol to lower their temperatures, have you, is that something you've encountered? Nobody that we've worked with has said that they've done that. Okay, thank okay. Um, Second question, just to, to, to get you to elaborate further, and I think you've been already clear on this, but let, let me put to you what Heather Humphreys, Minister, said in the Dáil, I think in May. She said that migrant workers in meat factories are not tied to any one employer. If they wish to work for somebody else, they may do so. In terms of how the system actually operates, that's inaccurate. Yes. Um, a worker has to work, uh, when you're on a work permit, you have to work for your, empl your, your employer for, for one year, okay? Um, after that year, you can change employer, um, in theory. So in pra there's, there's a difference between theory and practice, and I think that's the bit um, that's misunderstood. If you want to um, change your employer, you have, to work, you have to look for a new employer who's going to apply for a work permit for you. It costs 1,000 euros. You have to fulfill what's called the 50-50 rule. You can't have more, um, um, uh, you have to fulfill a labor market test. Um, you have to um, get assistance to apply for that if English isn't your first language. We've been working for 19 years with people who come to our centre to access help to, to, to get work permits, to change their work permit. It's very difficult unless you have supports. Um, uh, so it's not an effective way. So I think while you have a technical, while it is in theory possible, technically it's quite difficult. And Again, because of the fear of lo losing your immigration status, because your immigration status is directly tied to your work permit, that acts as a massive barrier for people because um, obviously nobody wants to be undocumented in the state. Um, I, we didn't mention undocumented workers, but there are some undocumented workers working in, in the meat industry as well. Um, so it's not an effective way to change employment. And all of that adds to the already existing power imbalance between the owners of these factories and uh, the workers to make it even more uh, extreme, which obviously adds to cases like uh, this. Um, I, there is an opportunity, may I add. There, is a, uh, there, in, there was a bill going through uh, the Oireachtas previously around uh, reforms to the work permit system. There was, in that, um, there, they were, there was a, a move towards the introduction of sectoral work permit or seasonal work permits, which we wouldn't be in favour of because it lessens again worker rights. It, 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 it allows people for a period of time. So there is moves to, to look at changing the work permit system, um, and I think it would be really, really important in in those moves to change it that it that we don't continue to work off the same old, outdated system that we have. Thanks. Just just finally. Just could I, you're saying that no unannounced inspections take place, either of working conditions or of health and safety, or, or very few. 
I, I, in, in terms of the labour inspectors, um, I wouldn't say there's no, but there's a minimum. M minimal. Um, in terms of the HSA, my understanding is that most of them have been announced. Uh, again, um, y we, you'd have to ask the HSA the, the figures on that because I don't have it. Can I get one more question? Sorry? Can I get one more question? Thank you very much, Chair. Um, just, it's that general question again, um, which is, like, I raised this with then Minister for Agriculture, Minister Creed, on the 30th of April. I said, we need to have inspections of meat factories, and he accused me of smearing the meat factories, smearing the employers. Why is it that they were so defensive? Like, why is it that we have neglect of, exactly as Deputy Smith made the point, of the third biggest sector in terms of um, clusters? What, why has the government, has previous governments proved so defensive of the sector? I mean, it's, very, it's a very embedded sector in our economy. Um, you know, obviously from farmers to meat processors um, to kind of ancillary workers, you know, it, it, it's a big employer. Um, and, and, and it provides, obviously, um, you know, links to rural communities and, and, and other things. Ernest, I don't it, it, think most farmers would be overly protective of meat factories. Would they, sorry, what? Most farmers wouldn't be overly protective of meat farmers. N but in any event, that question has been asked and answered, Deputy Murphy. If it was a new question, maybe I'd be more <laughs> indulgent. Vested um, interests. Thank you. OK, that's the response. Um, thanks. The, from the regional group, uh, yeah, from the regional group, Deputy Shannon. Uh, thanks, Cohirlock, and thanks to our contributors here today. Uh, could I just highlight that a lot of work has been done by Deputy Dennis Nocton in this area, who was the first to break the story in terms of, of the sharing of data. But could I just ask our contributors here today, I think it was evident that the contact tracing had broken down, which was the reason for sharing the information. And do you have a view on when data privilege um, trumps uh, you know, personal or public health risks? Um. Tony Hula himself said, you know, confirmed that it was a breach of confidentiality and that it didn't trump, um, you know, um, a person's right to, to privacy and having their data uh, protected. I think it's a fundamental of uh, health, health data is, is considered like one of those kind of gold standard um, data protect for under data protection. So it's, re it, 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 it's really important that um, I don't think, that, as we said before, there wasn't a problem if, as long as workers were informed themselves, um, if there's a secondary layer to protect, you know, in terms of public health, that's, that's, that's fine, but that wasn't, that's not what it is. And I'm still not clear, to be quite honest, on, 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 on what those, you know, what it is. Um, it, yeah. Uh, I, think, I think your own statement reflects, I think it was Dr. Mannix highlighted the issue of uh, the differences in languages and the length of time it took to con uh, contact people. And uh, I think this is something that needs to be borne out in the future. If we look at what happened in Germany, I think we're all afraid of a second wave and obviously their learnings. I would commend you on the couple of points that you make uh, regarding the HSE inspections. Uh, it mirrors what HIC would do, where the day before they go into hospitals, they let them know they're coming. It's, that's wholly unacceptable, and I think we need to change those practices. Absolutely, the HSA should come on in unannounced. And uh, I have five years of work experience in the meat sector. I know quite a bit about it. And uh, there are absolutely there are people who operate to different standards within it. And I think uh, certainly the employers that I know would not fear an unannounced inspection. But I think that should happen. Could I ask you also in terms of the sectoral permits that you spoke about, where is the resistance coming from to allow workers to be able to move from one employer to another? Who is challenging uh, you know, your work on that? The, the Department of Jobs. Department of Enterprise. Or Enterprise Trade and Employment now, yeah. And, and have you asked the department under, you know, what's the legal basis for, uh, for them? I know, let's say, that somebody could come in and begin a contract of work, but surely, as happens in other countries, once you come in after a period of time, you were able to move. Why are these people embedded with an individual employer for such a length of time? It's, it's in the Employment Permits Act. Um, 2014 um, amended, and that's where this is contained. So in order to actually... Uh, introduce new work permits, we need, an we need um, um, that act to be amended. And can I ask, have you tried to lobby? Uh, yes, yeah. many and, times. 
and maybe again, Chair, this is something that the, the COVID committee itself should look to give a report on. Um, just the other thing you said uh, in relation to accommodation, that 82.5% in your statement said that workers do not live in employers' accommodation. So I was aware back in, I think it was back in April, uh, where we have local meat factories that at the weekend some of the employees there were travelling, you know, 150 miles up the country to uh, meet with others. And I think that's something that you need to address as well. It's not just the factories have an obligation here. Certainly the employees have an obligation to, to um, look at their own practices, as we all do, in terms of the public health measures. And um, I suppose just uh, maybe the, uh, the last question I would ask you now, uh, I think you may have already answered this to a degree, but do you feel now that there are any factories who are still not 100% compliant in terms of COVID guidelines and HSA regulation? Um, yeah, sure. Just with regards um, kind of workers' responsibility um, and their behaviour around COVID, you know, if you are working in a, in a work environment where your employer hasn't put in any health and safety measures, where you're working shoulder to shoulder at the same or even increased production rate, um, you know, I think that there is a responsibility for the employer to have been giving um, resources and information to workers about good hygiene practice, about social distancing. A lot of the public information that was available was in English. So people weren't necessarily being educated at the same rate um, as, as kind of Irish English speakers. Um, and if you are kind of going to work day in day out and being exposed, you do have less of an incentive to um, to kind of maintain social distancing outside of work. But I think that the conversation um, around workers' behaviour during that time it really negates the the um, kind of legal obligation for the employers well, to have put in appropriate I, health and safety. Chair, just one more, if I may, and I accept that. Could I just ask you the other area, which is appears to me to be unregulated, is agency, and you've spoken about workers working for between ten and. 11 50 euro an hour. When I worked in the meat business, bonusing was a standard in terms of trying to get productivity levels up. So it would be unbelievable that people could be working. So I assume the agency is getting this margin. And have you done anything to try and understand what the agency contracts uh, predicate on employees? And I think that's an area that needs to be challenged in the future. Yeah, we, we have limited data at the moment. We're, we're collecting it um, on, on agency workers and what their conditions are um, in, 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 in the sector. Um, it, is a, it is a minority, as we, we said already, but we want to understand it better ourselves. So we will come back to you when we have more information on that in particular. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Mm. Uh, thanks very much, um, Deputy Shanahan. Um, um, just interestingly, what you said is substantiated by the SIP2 contribution to the European Federation of Food, Agriculture and Tourism Trade Unions. They say workers earn just the minimum wage or slightly above it. Some workers are in piecework. Uh, they're paid on the basis of the kilos they process, so to incentivise, I suppose. But it's basically minimum wage. It begs the question, Chair, in that situation, how are they only earning the minimum wage? You know, because I've worked in the meat business and absolutely there's productivity is, is um, you know, productivity and bonus schemes are how you get pro production up. I suppose look, it, maybe it's a question that we can usefully put to the Meat Industry Ireland at the next okay, session, yeah, but yeah, th yeah. Th thank you. Um, De Deputy Richard O'Donoghue. Thank you both for, for all the work that you're doing and coming today. Um, and thanks to Dale McGillney for contacting my office in regards to the, the migrant in factories. But in our area, it seems that, uh, that um, that the migrants are treated very well in, in the factories we have spoken to. But it's extremely difficult to get information in regard to migrants in factories and the management of migrants. Um, I have been listening to your, your stats coming 60 and 70 per cent of uh, factory workers from the migrants are, are, are having major issues. Um, we, after speaking to you, to you yourself, um, we contacted the nearest group to me, um, which would be the AB, ABP group, and we spoke to them, which they're based in Rakhil in America. Um, and they told us that they were 100% without any case of COVID in the plant. The COVID response team were established at every ABP site uh, at the end of February. Now, they have... And again, it goes back to the percentages that you've said earlier. There's 50 meat factories uh, in Ireland. ABP are nine of those 50. 
Now, does 30 per cent doing things right? If you, if you just on not naming people, I mean, people rarely object to being named if it's to hold them out as a paragon of virtue, but... I'm not, uh, I'm, not still, going, I'm not going to take uh, anyone out of character. I would still Yes, but I'm just, I'm just saying that I spoke to the, the ABP plant and asked them for their own, um, what they have done for their employees, and it's just based, based the case on what we are saying here. If, if everyone has to work together and put the facts together, you have spoken to, to the migrant workers. Is there pockets and areas around the country that we're having issues in? Is, it goes back to earlier speakers that we have. Is there a problem with management in the factories that are not carrying out their work properly for the people that are working in the factories? But I'm just going back on a statement that was, that was given to us yesterday to say that uh, every member of staff from management down is tested every day. But we've just heard earlier that some people are suggested that they are taking paracetamol to reduce their, their temperature, which was, which was mentioned by the earlier speaker. Uh, they are following the HC guidelines and constantly reviewing the worst scenario. Uh, they have seven, several COVID, COVID marshals. Again, it goes back to management. If we have to fix these problems, we have to go throughout the whole country and to every meat producer and figure out where are they falling down. But the people that are actually doing their work and doing it correctly, they also need to get... We don't want to paint all the meat factory with the same brush. We need to... Anyone that is actually doing their work properly and treating the migrant workers properly, they need to be commended if, they're doing, if their practice has been done right. And I'm not saying that ABP are doing it right or wrong, but what I'm saying is they were the nearest factory and they gave me a full list of what they were doing. But there are nine plants in Ireland. That is one-fifth of the plants in Ireland. So we need to figure out the pockets. And we need to, to work together to make sure that all the factories are compliant and looking after all migrant workers. So my question to you is, in order for, for us to be uh, more productive to you and to get the proper result for migrants, we need to know where the pockets are falling down. And you are the person that would have the stats from the people that you're talking to. You can actually work that into grass throughout the country. And we can figure up from our own counties, and each TD from each county can then get involved and say, right, you're not up to standard. Why aren't you up to standard? And then where we have a bigger problem, we all come together in a different part of the country and we push to make sure that they are compliant. So, from my question is, the stats that you, can you give us the stats where there is a falling down in the country and the pockets that we're meeting so we can actually address those factories and help you going forward? Um, with respect, I, 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 I don't actually think that's our role to give you the stats on where, um, um, you know, factories, individual factories are falling down. I do think that is a role for, for, for the state to, to understand we're here to put forward the, uh, uh, how workers have been treated. Um, and I think we have said already that there's, there's a massive inconsistency in approach across the country. Um, I, you know, we have said that some factories acted immediately and protected their workers and put uh, in good faith. Um, all, uh, all factories now have temperature testing. Um, some of the issues now is more of, of, all workers. of, of workers coming in. Yeah. Um, isn't that correct, Lee? Uh, the majority. Yeah, the majority. Sorry, the majority. There's smaller ones as well. The ma majority. Um, I. Yeah, so, so uh, what, we, what, what, what other workers have raised with us now is that there is, you know, there is PPE, there is temperature testing, um, social distancing is still an issue. So because it's um, uh, an industry, um, you know, where there are production lines um, and um, that people still, you know, are in quite close proximity to each other and, it, and, it, and it's hard to social distance. Um, so people are still concerned uh, for their health and safety at the moment. Um, and they're really concerned around um, that, that measures that have been introduced, that those practices are kept up. You know, again, if it's just for the inspection, 
that's what people, pe because they have such, there's such a history, and as we said, like 60% people, 60 of people don't know who their health and safety officer is. Mm -hmm. So there's such a history of, um, you know, non-compliance, lack of value, um, that people are really worried, although there is, you know, protections put in place, that these are going to slip because we've seen it in the past. Chair, just, just one. Just it's very brief. It's very, very brief. It goes back to what an earlier speaker said it. The department has given us one set of figures to show that there is no, that, there, that they have no concerns. You're giving us another yeah. side that you have concerns. For us to help, we have to have a bit of cooperation to know if there is pockets or if there is people that are not stepping up to it. It's the only way we can help because we, we are, are, are going through our, through our own guidelines. For us to help, we have to say, listen, you're wrong. You've given the wrong statistics. Where are the, the problems? If we keep going around where we're going, we're going around in circles yeah, and nobody thanks. can help each other. Thanks. I suppose what we do know is that there were 850 confirmed COVID-19 cases and 16 clusters in meat factories. Yeah. Yeah, I, um, there's new, yeah, fi there's new figures. Maybe we could move on from, from this, though, perhaps to the next speaker, if, if you don't mind. Uh, and that's um, from Fine Gael, uh, Deputy O'Dowd. So I just want to say that uh, it clear, it's clear to me that clearly there are huge disadvantages, both uh, in terms of health and obviously income and social other disadvantages and associated uh, with working in meat plants. And it's not just in Ireland. It's in England, it's in France, it's in America. And clearly the working conditions in terms of the lower temperature, the proximity of workers to each other, uh, you know, the long hours that they work, and then the social conditions that they live in exacerbate this issue. Mm -hmm. And obviously it is unacceptable. Um, I, I accept and acknowledge the issues that people have raised here about, about um, you know, the law and employment and unions and so on. And I understand that's for a different forum to hear in the context of getting a solution to the health issues. But clearly, if you can't vindicate the rights of people in terms of their working conditions and so on, and where they live and where they travel and so on, it, it, it doesn't make sense uh, for this to continue. So what I'm really saying, uh, if I've got it correct, that I appreciate and fully support what you're saying. And I, I, I think that we don't have figures in Ireland, but I have seen I think figures in the UK about minority communities uh, who get COVID as opposed to mainstream communities. In other words, that the immigrants tend to, I think anyway, tend because of the conditions that they live in or where they work, uh, they seem to suffer more from this illness. I think that that is true. So I'm just saying that what, uh, can you give us say five things or three, what are the key things that we need to do now uh, to protect workers in this situation, assuming that uh, the health issues, you know, uh, are prioritised in those, you know, what, what would you, what, how do you see as a solution to these immediately? Uh, if that's not, uh, you know, if that's enough of it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, we, I, I guess we have um, outlined some of the solutions. Um, Obviously, the unannounced inspections from the HSA. Um, we need better um, data, uh, both from the HSE and, and to speak to, to the last speaker's point um, uh, in terms of where the clusters are and how they're and, and, and a focus on those areas and those industries yeah. um, in, in, in where they are. I mean, we do, we really do need some kind of a sectoral agreement for this area, um, and I know that's difficult in, in the climate in, in terms of we don't have proper collective bargaining legislation here in, in the state. Um, so that is, that is something that also needs to be addressed um, and, and, and looked at um, in the current uh, government. Um, we would like to see more of a focus on this um, kind of a sectoral or a task force approach um, that w would bring um, employer bodies and um, maybe the state and, and unions um, together um, to look at this area and, and to, uh, to scrutinise also, um, you know, what kind of state funds are, are, are going uh, into this industry um, when kind of such low wages are given to, to, to workers. Um, um, we would like to see, obviously, it's not, it's not, in, it's not in your gift, unfortunately, at the moment, um, to give workers a, a bonus or, or, or a pay, but it is maybe in your gift um, to ask uh, the Meat Industry Ireland um, what their intentions are in, in relation to that, um, and, and, and if they would propose something to, to reward their workers uh, for coming to work every day, for working in hazardous conditions, um, and giving people a bonus um, throughout the last period. So maybe that is... 
is a gift that you can give workers here today to, to, to ask the meat industry. Um, yeah, and, and I, I suppose just data. We, we do need better. We do need better data, and we do need we we need um, also kind of the, the the HSA. I think to be a little bit more transparent in in how they go about doing their work, um, and 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 what the. Um, you know what their findings are. Everything's not reported on. Um, I do understand the reason why you know there is a, a, an approach that that they take. And if it, you know you can have a whistleblower that comes in and it reports, and you're not identified in that, and 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 that is important. However, I think there's a public interest element here um, that so isn't actually yeah. being served. And um, I think the HSA um, and, and indeed maybe the terms in which it has been set up, um, it needs to to look at that when in in, in the public public interest, um, what, you know, what, what its role and remit is. Just, just one other point. Uh, one you of have the another issues... five minutes, you were just... Pardon? You have an additional five minutes, so... Okay, okay. well, talk me a couple of those, Moshe. Sure. Uh, just, just to, one of the, I, I don't disagree with you at all, and I, I feel that uh, uh, communities in my town of Drogheda, for instance, you know, the migrant community, or uh, they formed a, you know, a, trying to get people together across communities, groups. Um, I'm probably not making myself very clear, but uh, they tend to be isolated. They tend not to mix w with other people. And we, we had a function at Drogheda where we had something like, uh, I think it was over 30 people speaking different languages. You know, it was like, a, it was a wonderful event that we had. And also, uh, you know, showing off their culture, their language, their heritage, everything like that. So there's a huge lot of work to be done, I think, in our society in terms of uh, embracing all of the different people from all of the different countries that come into our society. But I think the key point, one of the criticisms that was made of the COVID issue initially anyway, was that we didn't adequately uh, uh, use advertising and public information information sessions in different languages you know is to get at the core issue that people who lived in isolated communities didn't have access or didn't or they weren't addressed by public information and particularly by health information uh, campaigns is that a fair point to make and how would you how, what do we need to do yeah i think i think it is a fair point um in in terms of maybe building confidence and 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 uh, people who are, you know, having access to information in their own languages. Um, uh, NASC Ireland did a, um, a series of um, um, lang um, uh, COVID uh, specific um, um, information um, um, videos in, in people's own language. Um, just maybe to say, I suppose the labour market is, is a key site of integration. Um, for people in, right. in the state. Um, pay and conditions um, are, part and, are, are an important part of that. You know, if you're working maybe 50, 60 hours a week, you start at seven in the morning, um, you don't get home till five in the evening, you're ready to drop um, because your work is so hard, you're on your feet all day, you're you know, maybe in a cold environment, you're on a line all day. Um, that type of work impacts massively on your ability to engage in wider society and uh, engage in, in, in the social life of, of your community. Um, so if, if we don't kind of tackle long hours, low pay, we are a low pay economy, you know, one in five people work in low pay in the state. Um, so if we don't look at that um, in a holistic way, um, that's something, um, you know, that is, um, that's of concern. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Carmoga. Thank you, uh, Deputy O'Dowd. Um, Deputy Farrell, you have 10 minutes. Um, as for girl Lawher, I have to say I found the opening statement extremely powerful. And I think what's particularly scandalous is that we've known of the concern um, for workers in meat processing factories. And it's just something, something that isn't no, new. when we've known of the scandal of the mistreatment of these workers, all of which obviously um, such a proportion um, are um, from the migrant community. So I think that that was that COVID-19 was nearly a culmination of um, this, you know, what we've known for for so long. 
Uh, I think the fact that um, we've seen on the 1st of June that there were 1,054 reported cases um, is, is frightening, uh, especially in light of the fact that we knew that there was such concern um, regarding um, the mistreatment of workers in these factories for so, such a long time. Um, I did some research and the HSE don't seem to have a figure of how many of those um, cases were migrant workers and obviously from your own report we can see that six out of every ten um, workers are migrant workers. Do you have any idea of the percentage of the workers um, who contracted COVID-19, how, how high the percentage were of migrant workers? Great. Yeah, it's, it's, I guess it's hard for us to say mm -hmm. because um, we would be speaking like majorly with migrant workers. Yeah. So we, we're not necessarily, um, we have spoken to a few uh, Irish workers, but our uh, data pool, it, it, you know, is kind of overrepresented of migrant workers. Yeah. But I would kind of go back to my earlier point that um, even though 58% of uh, the workforce are from a migrant background, those people are over, um, people from a migrant background are overrepresented on, on factory floors. And that's where the okay. greatest um, kind of levels of exposure to COVID took place. Okay, yeah, so... So it, I would I, be led to believe that it probably is a, ma a majority um, people from migrant background, but we do not have data. Yeah, I, like, I mean, that. yeah, that's definitely something that I would imagine as well. And I definitely think um, it's what Edel said there about us being a, you know, low pay economy, and it definitely highlights um, how difficult, you know, the real impact of low wages on people's lives. Um, and just even from reading um, your opening statement on that, um, you know, we saw in this COVID-19 response by the government that there was a huge amount of, um, of it was based on the whole aspect of personal responsibility. But the reality is, obviously, if you're in a low-income um, job, that is really taken um, out of your control in a huge amount of s ways, in the sense that like, the housing is likely to be cramped, the con work conditions are dire and they're precarious, and your ability to stay away from your workplace is obviously limited. Um, so would you, um, I suppose, say that had, if this was a higher paid, um, well, in your view, if this was higher paid, would it have limited um, the amount of infections if giving um, in terms of their own personal housing situation and all that? Um, I, 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 if it was higher paid, um, I, I think maybe that's, with respect, mm. maybe the wrong question. Mm. If I could turn that round, and um, it, it, it's more, how is the business of work conducted? Yeah. How are workers consulted? Mm. What are the mechanisms um, in place within a factory uh, to talk to workers, to consult about their health and safety? Um, I, I, yes, I think low, low low pay work people value their work people Absolutely. value the work that they do um obviously there a lot of the people we work with are in these jobs you know up to 15 years um so they're they they they're skilled in this work and they value the work that they do unfortunately the work that they do isn't as valued or they aren't as valued so um i do i think it's there's a number of kind of d deficiencies, and, and, and I think it's not just it's not just low pay. Um, but I, do, you know, if you have a workforce that um, has less power, maybe than the management, uh, than the owners, um, and there's a massive mm -hmm. power imbalance, I think that's where the, the the issues really arise. It's in in the gap in between that. Breed, I don't know if you want to come in and say something. No, I, no, I would agree oh, with what you said. Yeah. Um, just one thing that really kind of, I think, st stood out to me, um, I come from a German-speaking household, so my mother's German, so I understand, you know, the language barriers with my granny moving over and all that. So one thing that I um, found really um, distressing and disturbing, really, was the fact that the government failed to translate um, their, the literature, the literature that was so key for so many people to ensure that they have accurate um, information with regards to social distancing and, every, and, and their rights as well. And I mean, um, we saw this week, obviously, that huge money was spent on that and the fact that that, that wasn't done I, at the very start um, is baffling to me. But how significant do you think that was? And do you think that the material that's translated, which is now available, if that's sufficient? And if not, what else do you think needs to be made available? 
I, I think it goes back to my earlier point. It, it, it's fine to have um, things available and post it, but it's, it's the training and the information as to kind of it, its meaning. You know, so we can have information, but we, we have to, you know, be trained on what that means, um, you know, in, in terms of, of, of workplaces. And then that has to be monitored and fed back. And, um, and workers have to be part of the decision making. I think that's, that's been a big gap in this, um, that, you know, that workers aren't part of the decision making in how COVID is addressed. Uh, their voices aren't being heard within plants um, and they're not consulted. So you know, that it, that's something that's, yeah. that's deficient. Uh, yeah, no, I totally agree with you on that, absolutely. And I think that's unfortunately the reality in our society across so many workplaces. So I totally agree with you on that. Just even then in relation to those then that um, say in relation to contact tracing and that, and I saw um, the quote that you have in, um, in your opening statement. I mean, uh, that, that was outrageous in my opinion, but, um, did you find that um, the, in the contract, contact tracing then, was it mainly English that was used? I know that there were some translation services, and even then in relation to the information that was given to workers in their native language then, if they um, had COVID-19 to distribute to their household contacts, even the fact that they had to then go and distribute that when they were, had tested positive, was that sufficient in your opinion? Uh, Breeze, do you have any, do you want to answer that? Um, no, no, I... No, um, we, we, won't, we don't, won't have information on that. I think that's something, again, that the HSA need to detail and outline what languages they did um, uh, talk to people in, what, you know, how they provided information to people, what was the follow-up. Um, like we don't have that detail mm -hmm. um, at all. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I think it's something that the HSA or the HSE really needs to, to, to answer. Um, because I do, uh, there are gaps in our knowledge yeah, in, course, in, yeah. in, in yeah, relation yeah. to this, and it's yeah, in all of our so knowledge. Much, yeah. And the HSE for us is, 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 is also a, a big gap, as, as we answered the question earlier on this morning. Yeah, absolutely. And look, I mean, that's something then we'll pursue with the HSE, because I do actually think, especially then when there's like low levels of literacy and all that, I think that's a huge issue. Um, for for so many people, like, and I, I just think that's outrageous that that information wasn't provided from the from the very beginning mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, in their native language, especially when we know that there's a certain amount of languages um, and specific languages that are mainly used. Just in relation to the um, agency staff, um, one thing that I really kind of sprung out of me on the opening statement was the fact that, which is totally understandable, is that a lot of the workers were concerned about, like, you know. Um, being made public and that that could obviously have an effect on their workplaces and unfortunately that reality is it probably would have um, in, in, lo in lots of different situations. But in relation to agency staff, was it a situation where those who were hired through an agency were more concerned? Um, did they feel that they were in a more precarious situation? And also, did the agency itself have a role to play in the health and safety of the workers? Breed? Yeah, um, I would say that, again, I would, I would um, kind of re-emphasise that agency workers are a, a minority. Um, most, most workers are employed directly by their employer. Um, and kind of reports that we were hearing about agency workers were, um, you know, very specifically around workers that were uh, being brought in by agencies recruited in their home countries, um, being brought in and very much managed by the agency, so being put into agency-owned accommodation um, and the relationship kind of with their terms and conditions with, was with the agency um, rather than directly with the employer. Um, and for, for a group of workers um, in the Southwest, this involved, they were being forced to register as self-employed independent contractors in Poland um, and all of their, uh, all of their um, finances were being processed in Poland, and so essentially, when it came to to COVID, they weren't able to access healthcare. Um, they didn't have PPS numbers. You know, there was there was they basically had newly arrived in the state, and these are EU nationals. Um, so th they were very specifically and disproportionately affected during COVID. Um, you know, in, in a very different way as to people that were are directly employed. You know, by the employer. So I would say that there was. Um, increased barriers there but again that's something that we have only just heard reports about in the yeah. past you know two to three months um, and something we would definitely um, seek to investigate further. So would that mean that they wouldn't be entitled to pandemic unemployment 
Yeah. That was the case, yeah. yeah. They hadn't, yeah, they hadn't built it. Before. Well, I, people, uh, my understanding is that people were supported to apply for PPS numbers um, and to try and apply for the, the pandemic then. They hadn't built up enough time yeah. in the state, um, yeah, to be, able, to be able to do that. And they were also being asked to apply for um, illness benefit, I think, rather than the, the COVID pandemic payment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Devlin, you were wanted to. Uh, just want to come back in on uh, some of the points. Uh, I sh it was remiss of me at the outset to not thank the workers because all workers in meat processing or in any of the meat plants themselves, um, they were the one of the sectors, as you highlighted in your own remarks, that kept going throughout the, the height of the pandemic, uh, and that should be acknowledged. And whatever um, scheme either the employer or indeed the state would look at, I think um, certainly it, it's warranted to, to, to examine that um, be, to, to acknowledge appreciation. Also, I think your recent remarks there, um, Adele, about the uh, not all factories or not all companies are in this same boat. I mean, it's quite a pessimistic conversation we're having about you know, meat. Uh, the meat sector, but actually it's not every single one. But in saying that, there are obviously some who are particularly uh, persistent with um, or, or light touch regulation, as it mm. were. Um, and, and those are the ones that need to be um, honed in on. You, you were also mentioning then that um, there could be some undocumented workers. So there could be people, particularly with the advanced notification of inspections, people being told not to come in or conveniently going off for a little while off shift. Um, can you talk a little bit maybe more about evidence that you have of that or, or experiences that you've been told about situations to enlighten us on those kind of issues? I mean, we've been working with undocumented workers for over kind of 15 years, um, and they're represented in all sectors across the economy. Um, Agri-food is no different. Um, generally employed in smaller, much smaller um, factories or, or um, sections of, the, of, of this particular subset of the industry. Um, it, it's not a huge, it, it's not a, a, a high, high number um, uh, um, in our, um, with our information. We do have a new kind of survey coming out soon in relation to undocumented migrants. There is a commitment in the program for government to introduce a scheme uh, for undocumented migrants. So it would be very welcome, you know, to include all, all workers in that, um, including this group of workers. Um, it, I suppose in, in terms of uh, it, it, it's, it, it's our experience over the years around inspections that uh, people who, um, you know, who may be more vocal um, may be asked not to come in. I'm not saying it's particular to this particular yeah, industry. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think it's something that's systematic um, across the sector and it's something that um, employers can prepare for um, if, 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 if they want, uh, you know, if they so wish to do. Um, and, and, and again, not painting every employer with the same brush. Um, however, we do know um, that there are high uh, incidences of exploitation in, in and across the sector and non-compliance. So enforcement really is key to moving forward uh, and the, the, the money necessary to do that as well yeah, for the agencies responsible. Absolutely. And then bringing it to more current day, obviously we saw the OR number um, it's close mm. to or near one now, and that's you know, it's it's alarming in itself. But if there were a second wave, and I, I'm reading the statement for our next session now, um, do you think things will or have improved now? I mean, surely the figures in the last say couple of weeks indicate that all factories seem to have got on board and realised that this had to be dealt with. Also, obviously, the number of inspections increased, mm -hmm. the number of the, the, the public um, spotlight, as it were, was on the sector. So naturally, improvements happened. However, if there were a second wave, uh, we obviously have to be conscious of, of what we've just experienced. And if you're saying that majority of all se um, plants have now temperature controls and all the other facilities that's welcome mm -hmm. um, but are you confident and I'm not asking you as an individual but just from your experience do you think that the sector will continue uh, to comply as it is as of today 
if there were a second wave? We can only go on what the workers tell us. Mm. Um, and there's a very mixed picture about what the workers tell us. Yeah. Um, some are confident, some are very unconfident um, in terms of the, the stats that we've provided to you. Um, a lot of people are scared that it'll slip back. Um, and, um, you know, production levels are, 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 are at, at the same rate. And it would be interesting maybe to ask the meat industry around their production levels right throughout uh, the pandemic and now, because, you know, how, how high they were, um, what was the output that was being, um, you know, uh, throughout the whole, the, the whole sector. Because um, I think that's indicative of how, how fast workers are working, where they're working, and, and you know, so that's a really piece, important piece of information, I think, um, that we don't uh, have. And equally then, from your own experience uh, of what you've been told and what your organisation has learned, those who were reporting either symptoms uh, of illness, so regardless if it was um, thought to be COVID or not, uh, or those who actually reported sick. Do you have, can you enlighten us maybe on experiences there with workers in which who, who have come to you with those experiences? Bree, do you want to answer some of that? Sorry, what? what Just people who have reported sick or have felt symptoms. Uh, what was the experience with the employers, with their, with their employers uh, as to their willingness to either allow a day off or testing of the employee or what measures were taken to prevent a potential spread. Uh, the advice that we're all adhering to now. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, some people were told, you know, to go straight home. Some people who maybe didn't have symptoms um, felt pressure to go to work. I think a lot of people were concerned um, about the kind of loss of wages. Um, and I think that there were instances as well. These, these are anecdotal reports. Um, of people who uh, say they lived with um, they lived with another worker, where the worker at the beginning, the worker who wasn't who had tested, say they both had tests and one was negative, one was positive. The worker who tested negative was still being asked to go to work and not self isolate for for two weeks. Um, so I think there was a pressure on workers to come to work, but equally, um, you know, kind of a lot of intimidating, threatening behaviour. Um, around compliance around COVID as well and, and that kind of lack of um, communication with workers for sure was existed but we don't have specific stats from workers who were or weren't sick you know so for the respondents that we have we didn't ask them whether they tested positive or not okay uh, then finally through the chair if I may please um, did you see a spike in your own uh, number of cases that you were dealing with at the outset of the pandemic or during the pandemic at the height of the pandemic um, compared to, say, your regular work, uh, has this given you a massive surge? I mean, I'm assuming it has, but I'd just like confirmation of that, please. And maybe the, the numbers of how, how many are we talking about? How many cases have you dealt with over the last, say, March through to current day? Um, please. I mean, our work probably tripled um, over the the in in a five week period. I suppose we we responded to 855 uh, people who were coming to the service. Um, obviously, our service had to work remotely. Um, 855 in a five week period. Um, so that would be unusual. You know, that's yeah. kind of like a quarter of our work for a year. Um, so we had a huge spike in in calls and emails and. Um, that we were responding to people and, and mainly around COVID payments and um, health and safety um, and then if you didn't have access to that around exceptional needs payments and, and, and areas like that. Um, so that was a, a huge spike in, yeah, in our services in that time. What sectors typically, I mean obviously they weren't all from the meat industry mm. I would have thought, what, sec what other sectors were people? Um, healthcare, uh, domestic work, uh, retail, um, restaurants, hotel, catering, um, so kind of across the board, a lot of undocumented migrants um, contacting our services as well. Um, and um, yeah, they were the main. Thanks very much. Um, if I could just ask a couple of questions, Deputy, I don't know who do you want to come back in? Well, I was, yeah, if you want to come in now, I was going to bring you at the end, but if you want to come in now, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah um, I'm just happy to see that, that people would have no access to payments, and especially if they've been using the likes of Poland and becoming self-employed here. I'm self-employed myself. Um, I don't have any migrant workers. Um, but 
every one of our workers are considered to be a team and I would hate to see that anyone is treated with such uh, disrespect and, and anyone that is working, especially that have mm. kept um, us going as a country at a time of a pandemic and kept food on our tables that would be treated any differently. Um, and just to tell you yourself is, from my own point of view, and I said it earlier on, it's whatever I can do from my side of things. I do believe it. everyone else collectively here will do the same. Is, but we all need to work with the statistics and the facts that you have, as, as long as the ones we are, because they're all conflicting, and we need to find the true picture so we can all help. Thank, Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Dermot. Thank you. Um, just uh, coming back again to this uh, report by the um, European Federation of Food, Agriculture and Tourism Trade Unions that SIP2 contributed to, they basically say that uh, violation of workers' rights are more frequent in the red meat industry as it is poorly organised. The situation is slightly better in the pork and poultry industry where the level of unionisation is higher. SIP2 will try to increase membership and negotiate a collective agreement that improves pay, ensures pension and sick pay for all meat workers in Ireland, but the lack of engagement from employers hinders any attempt to strengthen social dialogue. And then crucially, they say, access to site for trade unions is also extremely challenging. Uh, the employer doesn't have an obligation to bargain collectively, even if high levels of union membership exist. Have you ever encountered difficulty with site access, or is that something that you do? You typically meet um, workers in the meat industry. Do you typically meet them off-site? Yeah, we would typically meet them off-site. Um, so we wouldn't we wouldn't be going on-site to workers. Uh, we wouldn't want to expose them in any way. Um, and you know, we kind of get in touch with people. Uh, worker to worker, word them out, um, you know, and build build our connections that way. I think it's um, obviously a very big issue for the state more generally around collective bargaining and the recognition of trade unions to to bargain in uh, collectively with uh, in the meat industry and other industries. Um, you know, the lack of recognition of unions by employers um, is. is, is is a real problem in the state um, and I think that's uh, effectively what SIP2 are referring to uh, in their submission is that lack of lack of recognition um, and lack of um, you know there's a lot of hostility um, towards unions and to worker representative organizations um, from employers and employer bodies. Can I um, also just add there that uh, we've also found reports of intimidation of workers who um, become union members. And as Adele kind of um, said that when there are inspections and, and those are announced, often those people, those kind of like, are, they're seen as troublemakers um, and they're kind of either given the day off or not invited to certain meetings or there's definitely like a lack of, um, you know, kind of proactive uh, engagement with union members on site. Just returning, I think we have a couple of minutes yet, just returning to the issue of work permits. I mean, is it the case that you can't get a work permit from within the country that you have to apply from without, or how does it work? Yeah, you have to. So there's a number of um, steps that you have to take. It is quite difficult for employers to actually, you know, get a work permit um, in terms of um, they... We have a, um, a system that's based on a skills-based model. It doesn't really take into account um, kind of uh, the labour market and where the labour market might be. So um, we, the Future Skills Needs Group, make recommendations around the eligible categories of employment. So we've a huge amount of eligible and ineligible categories of employment in the work permit system. Um, so for this, the red meat industry, um, there were a number of quotas introduced over the last three years um, because there was a, the, the meat industry demonstrated a demand um, or they provided data that seemed to demonstrate a demand um, for, for new work permits. Um, so then you have to uh, advertise um, your work per, your, um advertise for a certain period of time. You have to fulfill a, a rule that says you can't have... Uh, uh, more than 50 EU uh, non-EU workers, uh, which I believe, you know, that that might be questionable now, and I think that potentially might be why some of the the data is a little bit um, not clear. Um, it's Can called the 50/50 rule. It's in our hmm. legislation. Um, yeah. So, but if I could ask you, I mean, if you work for one meat factory and mm. you just don't like the job, or they don't like you. Either if you're let go or you leave, 
and you have a, you know you're a, a third country national so you're here on the basis mm. of a work permit how then can you go on to work for somebody else in this area or in another area? Oh, yeah, you don't have to leave the country. Um, you, you have to apply for a new work permit, though. So you have to... Um, and then the, the employer applying for that new work permit has to fulfil these conditions as well. Um, so it's kind of hard to move because you can't work in the state without a work permit. Um, so if you're trying to change jobs... Um, it could take maybe six weeks to two months to kind of get that or longer to get that in place. Um, so it is, it, it's, it's difficult. So a worker, I decide, OK, this job is really bad. Um, <clears throat> I want to leave it. I'm going down the road or the next town. I'm, I'm going to get another job. Um, they get the job, but they, they have to advertise that. They have to advertise in national newspapers. So there's a cost to the employer in terms of advertising. Um, somebody has to pay a thousand euros for the work permit. That can be an employer or a worker. In, a lot of times it does, it, it can fall to the worker in renewal circumstances. Um, is that provided for in law or is it? Is it, it, it is, yeah. <laughs> didn't know but that it can be the, the employee themselves. It is provided for in law because it was our experience that a lot of, uh, particularly on renewals, that a lot of workers were actually paying for their own employment permits. And if it was refused, it was important then that um, the worker got the money back and not the employer. Um, so you, you, you can tick a box, basically. Um, so it, is impo it, it was an important uh, move, actually, that we campaigned for to, to, um, to include that people were, um, had the ability to apply for their own work permits as well. So, and okay. it was a lot to do with the money. Um, yeah, so then I've forgotten my train of thought there. Yeah, I interrupting <laughs> you. No, it was just the difficulties of moving from one... Um, employment to another situation, if you're here on the basis of... Yeah, workers. and I, 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 it, it is that it's to fulfil these certain amount of rules, so the 50-50 rule, the labour market test, um, the payment for the... Um, uh, the, the employment permit, getting an uh, employer who will apply for a work permit, be a lot of employers... Now, bigger employers would be familiar with you know the work permit system and how to do it and they may have a, a HR they will have a HR team and staff and then others won't so they won't be so familiar with it. We're almost out of time. If you're here as an undocumented migrant and you're here without any lawful basis to be here, can you apply for a work permit to um, to regularise your situation? No, it's not possible. It's, uh, it's not possible to you can only apply for a work permit if you have a stamp one in the state um, and you have to get that through an initial uh, work permit. Would you permit me to read a statement by a worker that they've given to us in the last... How, how long is it? In the last... It is a minute and a half. Yeah, OK, we've a minute and a half and then we're... <coughs> conclude. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, just to close with this. I work in a big meat factory with over 500 employees. I have been employed there for over 10 years. We have been working very hard during the lockdown and equally now. Initially, we were still working shoulder to shoulder... For us, production did not slow down during this period. For the first four weeks, we had no proper PPE and no guidance about the lockdown. I'm a very good worker and I value the work I do. If the disease was in the animals, they'd have to close the place. But for workers, the factories can do what they want. We had an inspection, but I don't know what happened during the inspection. It looks like it is finished. Maybe we came out good, not sure, as we are not informed. Changes have been made since they know the inspection is coming. We have full PPE, masks and shields, and temperature testing is carried out daily now. But the two metre distance is still impossible. There are a lot of people on the floor because production is still the same and they need many people to work. We have staggered breaks, but some areas are small, so we are often queuing on top of each other. It's almost four months in, and I still don't really feel safe because there are so many people still working to make up orders. I think that pressure needs to be kept on meat factories to ensure compliance. Also, no worker in my factory has gotten any extra pay during this time, despite working in the middle of a global pandemic without proper protections, but in a sector that was deemed essential work. This is not fair. I want to ask the committee to make sure we are protected, that health and safety breaches are taken seriously and acted on, that we are respected and paid better for the work we do. I think all workers should get a bonus for the work we have done. Thank you very much. Thank you. And with that, I think we'll um, suspend until 2.30. Thank you very Great. much. Great. Thank we'll, you very we'll much. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you.